say good morning to you. Good morning. Okay, thank you. Oh. <laughs> good morning, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Cook County Public Health and Human Services Board to order on this Tuesday, April 16th, 2024, at 8.31 a.m. Uh, first item is the approval of the consent agenda, which includes our meeting agenda and the minutes, um, also financial report, abstracts and bills, uh, hire of Laura Nelson as adult services social worker, and the approval uh, to hire Leanne Avery as the office support specialist in case aid um, with public health and human services. Are there any uh, items a commissioner or, um, would like to pull or discuss or um, any additions or changes to the agenda? Doesn't look like it. Well, that's good. Now what happens? I'd like to make a motion ah. to approve the consent agenda as written. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. We have a motion. Is there support? Rana? Support. Thank you, Rana. Motion and support. Any further discussion? Hearing or seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And that moves us down to a proclamation. And just for clarification, I myself cannot proclaim things, but we as a board can, even though it says my name on the, on the bottom of it. Um, and I'd just like to take a moment to, to read this. Uh, whereas child abuse and neglect is a serious problem affecting every segment of our community and finding solutions requires input and action from everyone. And whereas in 2023 there were 90 child protection intake reports made to Cook County Public Health and Human Services. And whereas our children are our most valuable resource and will shape the future of Cook County. And whereas protective factors are conditions that reduce or eliminate risk and promote the social, emotional, and developmental well-being of children. And whereas effective child abuse prevention activities succeed because of the partnerships created between families, child welfare pro professionals, education, health, community and faith-based organizations, businesses, law enforcement agencies, and the business community. And whereas communities must make every effort to promote family-serving, youth-focused prevention programs and activities that create strong and thriving children and families. Whereas we acknowledge that we must work together as a community to increase awareness about child abuse and contribute to promote and the social and emotional well-being of children and families in a safe, stable, and nurturing environment. And whereas all citizens need to be more aware of child abuse and neglect and its prevention within the community and be involved in supporting <coughs> parents to raise their children in a safe, nurturing environment. And whereas prevention remains the best defense for our children, families, and communities. Now, therefore, I, David Mills, Cook County Public Health Human Services Board Chair, do hereby proclaim April 2023 as Child Abuse Prevention Month in Cook County and call upon all citizens to recognize this month by dedicating ourselves to the task of improving the quality of life for the children and families, thereby strengthening the communities in which we live. Um, any thoughts from anyone on the pro proclamation? This is something we can support as a board, I hope. Absolutely. Okay, good. Uh, is there any, any uh, motion to, to make this proclamation official? Oh, well, sure, we'll make that official. Thank I support you. that. Thank you, Commissioner Starley. We have a motion. Is there support? Support. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Motion and support. Any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing or seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And um, moving on to item four is our staff report. And today we have Hannah Miller here. And Allison, do you want to do an introduction at all or no? Hannah, do you want to do an No. <laughs> <laughs> I can start out with an in introduction and let Hannah introduce yeah. herself as well. We're just so glad to have Hannah here this morning. We try once a year. Sometimes it's every couple of years, depending on if there's a global pandemic happening. But having <laughs> staff from the Sawtooth Mountain Clinic come and present to the board, Hannah and her colleagues at Sawtooth Mountain Clinic provide a range of public health services on behalf of the county, supported through county and state grants. We're so grateful for this partnership. It's been in place since I believe 1998. So very long standing partnership between our two organizations to support community members throughout the county. So Hannah's here to talk more about parent child health services in particular. So thank you for being here, Hannah. 
Thank you, Alison, and thank you to this board for having me here to speak with you. It's really an honor. Um, and um, here from Sawtooth Mountain Clinic, I'm, I'll be focusing mainly on my role and the parent-child health-specific programs, which it seems like fits really well with our topic, or our beginning today, thinking about child abuse prevention. Um, so in, uh, in the next few slides, I'll be talking about my work, the different programs, intersections, uh, this partnership with public health, and how it plays out for our local families. Hey, Hannah, before we start, um, yes. would you like questions at the end, or is it okay to interrupt, interject, and ask questions? This example of a question as we go is really welcome. <laughs> Thank you for saying so. Yeah, um, please, as, as we go, this can be very conversational, and your interest is what uh, brings this presentation to life, so thank you. Um, my, my credentials here in this role, I'm a registered nurse. Uh, I'm also licensed as a public health nurse. I am a certified lactation counselor and a Lamaze certified birth educator. A little bit more uh, about me is that I have my master's of nursing from the University of Minnesota with a special interest in integrative health and healing. Um, and I've been in this role at the clinic for five years. So here is a little overview of the programs that I have a hand in, um, providing services directly to families. And I'll have a little bit more about each of these uh, with WIC, uh, Family Home Visiting Represented, as well as the Follow Along Program, and CYSHN, which is Children and Youth with Specific Health Needs. <coughs> so, the WIC program, first of all, um, this is a supplemental nutrition program. It supports eligible families uh, with um, nutrition education, nutritious foods, breastfeeding support, and referrals to other services. Families can be eligible if they participate in another program, for example, Head Start or medical assistance or SNAP or if they um, are not participating in any other programs can just prove income eligibility with a similar threshold. Um, this is a, a time that is uniquely situated to invest in childhood nutrition uh, prenatally through age five. Um, I have a little chart here that shows um, a little bit of demonstration of why this investment at this critical time uh, makes such a difference and that is uh, we've got these brain development curves in the first thousand days uh, is where this dashed line uh, is. WIC goes all the way a little bit beyond that to sort of halfway down the red curve which is higher cognitive function, our uh, frontal cortex, our ability to think and process and learn and adapt lifelong. Um, so investing in nutrition, building the foundations for this brain development at this age uh, is a really strong investment with sensory first language and then that higher functioning. Um, there are um, the components of WIC, the one-on-one on, one on one individualized nutrition counseling can be anything from a family saying, I'm having a really hard time using all of this milk <laughs> that we're getting from WIC. Or what, you know, what would be the benefits of breastfeeding if I'm considering how I might feed my baby once they arrive? Or uh, a toddler who's showing some restrictive food preferences. How do, I, how do I manage this? How do I support this child to be able to eat a variety without pressure um, and to, to um, develop a lifelong favorable relationship with food? Uh, that one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling happens on a minimum once every three months for participating families, um, but it can be more if there's a specific question or a time where there's more counseling needed. Um, the foods that people get through WIC are uh, specific food benefits that target uh, nutrients that are often missing or deficient in many families' diets. Um, a couple of these are iron, folic acid, and choline. Iron uh, being uh, foundational for brain development, especially that has to do with impulse control. And we get that through our um, enriched grains that WIC provides. Uh, folic acid is about speed and flexibility in mental processing, and we're getting that through all of the fruits and vegetables and legumes that WIC provides. And then choline is present in the eggs and, and dairy, uh, and that is another brain development uh, essential nutrient that focuses on memory. So all of these things uh, might come up in a nutrition education counseling visit or maybe more behavioral topics like how do I actually 
do this? <laughs> how do I prepare these foods? How do I navigate uh, the grocery store and so forth? I, I really like this <coughs> graphic. Um, and it tells me to kind of maybe chill out with my son and his diet because, you know, he's getting to the bottom of that higher cognitive function. So pressure's <laughs> off, right? Fait accompli. <laughs> it's never <laughs> over. <laughs> However, <laughs> Uh, you can breathe a little sigh of relief, a lot of that development, you've, you've seen that nurture through. <laughs> yeah. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the WIC team who's involved. I'm here to represent it as the WIC coordinator, and uh, in WIC we call it the CPA, stands for Competent Professional Authority, that's just WIC lingo for who is actually delivering the service and offering that nutrition counseling. This year, uh, 2023 rather is uh, the year that we welcomed Angie Works to the WIC team. Uh, she is also a nurse at the clinic in different roles, um, but to have that bench a little bit deeper so that I'm not the only one um, it, it allows a lot more flexibility and um, and longevity to the program. Um, Karen Gullstrand has been with WIC a long time as the WIC clerk, which is an administrative position, but also culture keeper in a way. When we have WIC day, many appointments back to back. Karen is the one greeting people, helping to connect them to information that we might have around if they're waiting and create that play space and environment for families to feel very welcome. And then Britt Malik is our WIC breastfeeding peer counselor, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that kind of breastfeeding support looks like. Um, before I get to that, though, I wanted to, I wanted to talk a little bit more about another aspect of the WIC services that we provide. Um, we do assessments of height and weight and hemoglobin, which, in addition to these conversational assessments we have with families, helps us to understand what sorts of nutritional interventions might be useful. If there's a faltering growth pattern um, or any kind of indication that there may be a behavior that, that could... Um, could warrant some education or coaching, or if there's a medical concern, we are embedded in primary care at Sawtooth Mountain Clinic, so there's this beauty of easy referrals. Referral is almost the wrong word for it because we're in constant communication if there's a, a medical concern arising from some of these measurements. Um, hemoglobin is tested once a year for children who are, um, who are participating in WIC, and this is an indicator of iron deficiency anemia. And when I talked a moment ago about the role of iron in learning and development and impulse control, that's one of its roles. It's also basic oxygenation for the body. It's the thing that makes our blood red. Um, so very essential nutrient and anemia of this sort uh, disproportionately affects the WIC population. So this screening is particularly valuable. It's a very treatable, uh, preventable nutritional deficiency. Um, and an update or kind of special feature from this last year with WIC was a partnership that we had with the Cook County Farmers Market through the Northwoods Food Project and the Extension. Many partners um, brought this to be, and I have a quote from a family, a WIC participant. We've been going to the farmer's market every week, and it's been so fun. It just feels like a special treat. I love taking my son and showing him all the stands and the produce, using our tokens, and going right home and making dinner together. We've gotten a learning tower for him, so now when, he gets, when we get home, he can be part of what we do with the food we get from the market. So it's a, just a, a heartwarming thing to hear from a parent who received this. Um, through this partnership, we had some funding to offer uh, $10 worth of tokens uh, to every WIC family who showed up at the market to, to use on whatever, um, whatever of, the, of the rich array of produce was available or other foods, um, and to see this uh, start to finish, this education of where does the food come from? How do, we, how do we choose it? How do we connect with our community around food? And then how do we get home and prepare it? It's a really special project. This was um, a partnership, too, with the Northwoods Food Project, and um, they've put in a request to um, expand it based off of the success of the program, um, just really hoping to get more fresh um, food out to, to kids and families. And um, they made a request to the North Shore Collaborative, but <coughs> there was some um, concerns just about um, almost double dipping because there are um, state and federal programs, but the deal with those programs is they're so much more restrictive for um, this kind of uh, structure. So having the flexibility for our community through the Northwoods Food Project and the, this farmer's market is, is pretty key, and I'll be advocating uh, strongly for, 
for um, this program at the at the next um, North Shore Collaborative meeting. Mr. Hobbits, or Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Um, as part of that, in the community center running that program, we've kind of complicated that with our consent agenda today. I hope we realize there is going to be some gaps and that will be very important to because I believe that is a very important program and they've done a really good job at mm -hmm. the community center making sure families get these tokens and they were hoping to expand it but um, current yeah. events <laughs> I think with I mean I know Leanne was yeah very instrumental yeah. in that yeah. so it's a yeah I, yeah share the concern uh, I think a system is well we'll see yeah we'll see TB, just TBD. have that on your radar right. that we we're going to have to um, make sure that program doesn't fall through the gaps because it is important agreed okay sorry for the interruption <coughs> and thank you for it for that advocacy and, and support um, so a little bit about who's participating in WIC right now to know, you know this population. Um, but before I get into this, I, I wonder about a time stamp. How, f how far into my time do I have? Is anybody, Alice, anybody keeping track? The golden. OK. <laughs> um, so participation right now, um, this is a snapshot of data that I drew just yesterday. So this doesn't necessarily represent all of, all of the past year. But currently, there are 61 households using WIC in Cook County. Um, this, is, this does not include Grand Portage, who has their own WIC program. Um, so this is through Sawtooth Mountain Clinic. Um, among those 61 households are 94 participants. 15 are currently pregnant. 13 breastfeeding. A uh, breastfeeding adult can be certified with WIC for up to a year postpartum. Uh, there's one postpartum individual certified non breastfeeding eligible up to six months. Um, 18 infants, birth to a year, 47 children, uh, one through uh, their fifth birthday, and 26 peer clients who are getting breastfeeding support through Brit Malik. So that um, accounts for um, people in that pregnant category and the breastfeeding category. C can you speak to the up to a year part? Yes. Um, so uh, I think a lot of people think of WIC as, as for children. Um, the acronym actually stands for women, infants, and children. So adults can be certified if they are pregnant uh, or postpartum or breastfeeding. Those are the three adult categories. And so if you are providing any breast milk at all, whether it's direct latching or pumping, <coughs> any breast milk at all through that first year, you can continue to be certified and receive your own food package. But not beyond. Uh, the children may be certified right. beyond, but um, adults can only be certified within that perinatal time period. Thank you. This is um, quite a lot of data. <laughs> um, but just a quick snapshot of what we're seeing here. Uh, this is a little illustration of a dose-response relationship between WIC enrollment and participation and breastfeeding rates and duration. So um, on the left is statewide data. On the right is our Cook County data. And this is looking at five years aggregated from 2017 to 2022. The idea here is that um, on the left column, you see um, what kind of WIC participation they might have had prenatally, uh, whether they were enrolled for more than three months, uh, less than three months, or not at all during pregnancy. And the different colors represent the different breastfeeding durations. So statewide, um, the data reflects a, a, really, um, a really strong association between uh, prenatal participation and breastfeeding duration. If you look at longer than three months prenatal exposure to WIC as an intervention, 83.1% uh, of people uh, initiated breastfeeding compared to 79%, so a four-ish uh, four percent difference uh, increasing breastfeeding initiation. Um, I was interested to see what's happening locally in Cook County in this area. Number one, we have um, our, our breastfeeding initiation and duration rates uh, are exceeding the state average. Um, we don't have any data for less than three months during pregnancy of WIC. And this is really, I think this points to a really key thing about this embeddedness in 
uh, primary care at Sawtooth. We meet people, I meet people, I'm the first, um, first call that they make. They call the clinic and say, I'm pregnant, I don't know where to start, what do I do? They get routed to me and we get started um, with prenatal care generally, getting it all organized. Uh, WIC is part of that, and so we have really strong early pregnancy enrollment, and so there's, there, there was no data for those who uh, enrolled in WIC later in pregnancy. <coughs> uh, breastfeeding peer counselor with Britt Malik. This is another little graph showing, and this is again statewide data from 2019. Um, but the difference that a peer can make in terms of, um, again, breastfeeding duration. Uh, the darker blue is those who had the support of a breastfeeding peer counselor, which had an impact at every stage. Some family feedback. I've been talking to Britt a lot. She helped me understand this pain might not be normal, that it might be a lat tissue. She said she such helpful things, helping me understand that this is my journey. I have choices and this powerful intuition. And I don't have to follow a certain pattern or have a freezer full of milk. She reached out right about the time I was weaning, and she said congratulations and all the things I needed to hear at the moment. It was so helpful. <coughs> so um, leaving WIC behind and giving a few moments to family home visiting. Um, family home visiting is a voluntary home-based service, ideally delivered prenatally through early childhood. It provides social, emotional, health-related and parenting support to inf and information to families and links them to appropriate resources. And listed here are a few of the ways that family home visiting can reach families um, to create a safe and health healthy environment, preventing child abuse and neglect, um, and support for parents as their child's first teacher. This, uh, this slide shows um, a snapshot from a newsletter that the MESH program put out. MESH, uh, Maternal Early Childhood Sustained Home Visiting, is an international evidence-based home visiting program, uh, which is one of, our, one of the models that we offer here. Uh, it's based out of Australia, and uh, they put out a newsletter globally um, each quarter. And Cook County was highlighted in this newsletter uh, with the anonymous feedback of a participant um, who said, I wish everyone had access to a public health nurse like the one who helps our family. I'm well educated and plan for my children, yet becoming a mother has been the hardest thing I've done. This public health nurse helps me with all facets of parenting and gives me the tools and confidence I need to be a great mother. She's truly positively affected my ability to parent my children and stay sane in the process. Additionally, because she has gotten to know our family so well and pays wonderful attention to all the details of our family, she's often able to offer insights into my children's behavior and motivation that I miss or lose sight of. Really meaningful feedback. <laughs> and also to, to be um, seen and acknowledged on this scale uh, of um, many, many programs offering MESH uh, globally. Bless you. Bless you. So, some of the things that home visiting does <laughs> is answer the questions that parents have. Sometimes it's a curriculum that I can offer when parents say, I don't know if I have anything to ask. I don't know what I should be asking. But a lot of questions I get uh, might be, is it normal <laughs> for me to feel this way, for my baby to cry this much, for my baby to lose weight like this, for my baby to need me like this? <coughs> um, I'm uniquely pos positioned in these long-term relationships with families to get to know them, to know what might be normal, normal range of emotion for them, for them to be able to ask me, I'm feeling not myself, what support is available for my mental health right now. Um, for my baby to cry this much, this is a really important factor in child abuse prevention. If parents know what to expect with normal newborn crying, um, there it's far less likely that episode at the peak of crying at two months where a parent is just at their wit's end and, um, and, and might shake their baby, which of course we know to cause irreversible brain damage and sometimes death. And that crying is the main, main risk factor and trigger. So if a parent knows prenatally and as time goes by what normal crying can look like, what to do, how to cope, acknowledging their own limits um, when they need to step away is, is a really a significant factor. Um, lactation support is embedded in this, just like it is with WIC. So uh, for a person who a week with their newborn sees that their baby has lost weight, doesn't panic, knows that it's normal, <laughs> knows that it's a completely appropriate and that that baby after that first week will start to gain weight. Um, knowing, knowing those boundaries 
and, and if there is a weight concern, to be able to get medical care um, and lactation support. I mentioned MESH, uh, the two kind of tracks that a family might take with home visiting um, can be universal home visiting, which um, is as the need arises. This is the kind of the first way that a person might engage with home visiting. Usually that first visit that I have with somebody is under this umbrella. Um, and I'll show you a little bit more about when people are using this service. Um, MESH, meanwhile, is that sustained model where somebody says, I could really use support all the way along the journey from prenatal to two. I anticipate that I'm just going to want those frequent touch-ins. And so MESH um, is built around 25 visits over two years. Uh, using some structured curricula, but always with the foundation of meeting a parent's needs in that moment. Um, and the stated goal of the MESH program is to assist a parent's adapting and self-managing, that idea that there are changes at this time, and, um, and that self-management to be able to self-regulate as well as to achieve one's goals are uh, foundational to parenting confidence. Universal home visiting at the clinic in 2023, 115 visits total. Uh, distributed among the many formats that people can access this care through in-person visits at home, at the clinic, telehealth. Um, there are still um, a majority of people in, in, in this past year who are finding telehealth to be just a really great access point for them. Uh, and that was something that um, was far reduced from the previous year when COVID was more of a topic and more of a safety concern. Um, but people are still utilizing that, those options. <coughs> Utilization stages, the yellowish green is prenatal. A lot of people have a lot of questions prenatally. This is also a time that I'm offering prenatal breastfeeding education, birth education under this umbrella of universal home visiting. Zero to two months postpartum is the second most used category. Um, but many people continue having visits um, sporadically or continuously through the later months. Three to five months in blue is a time period when um, statistically it is most likely that somebody will reveal intimate partner violence to a home visitor or a mental health challenge. And so that no, knowing that people can, can continue that relationship um, to those critical time periods is, is very valuable. I will uh, skip this video, although there, the CHB did provide some really lovely outreach materials, which we have posted at the Sawtooth Mountain Clinic website for families and others um, to get linked and see uh, sort of regional feedback and descriptions of home visiting programs. The last two things, there's just a slide each on these. Um, the follow along program um, is one of the ways that we offer developmental screening through the clinic birth to five um, embedded in well child visits. Um, although somebody perhaps doing well child care at another clinic, perhaps in Duluth, um, can still access the screening program through the home visiting. Um, we use the ages and stages questionnaires, which are uh, validated across cultural spectrums. Um, and they have associated activities for parents to think of different games that can be, or different play that can be developmentally uh, appropriate, and we screened 87 children in this program um, in 2023. And then children and youth with specific health needs. <coughs> we get, uh, I get referrals from the Minnesota Department of Health um, it, based on results from a newborn screening or hearing screening, prematurity, um, birth defects, other specific diagnoses. And this service allows for tracking of care and coordination to make sure that families are receiving support through the state and through their local uh, and specialist care options. Um, and in 2023, um, the service reached four children in need of the service. So that concludes the survey of, of parent-child health that I meant to bring to you today. And I'm open to questions, to, to <coughs> feedback. Thank you for your attention and time at this. Thank you, Hannah. This is uh, super powerful and uh, extremely important and really appreciate the work that, that you do. Um, we, we talk about, uh, often we talk about um, just the importance of those early years and how big a difference it is and, and what we can do to support those, those ages and um, something we bring up with our legislators too. So um, we, all, we all value that work. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Any questions? Oh, Commissioner Starley. Um, thank you. Great report. It's good to have this update once in a while. I'm just curious, you know, I'm not into any of that age group or anything, uh, but how do you advertise? Is there only people that come to the clinic? Um, how does the WIC program reach out to the greater community? Hmm. Excellent question. So um, there is a huge advantage to being embedded in the clinic in the sense that, um, for better or for worse, we are healthcare available locally, and so we get to reach a lot of people that way. So anybody who comes to the clinic gets connected with, with, with me or WIC. Um, for those who maybe move to the county later when they have a child already um, or don't know their resources, um, that's a time that um, occasional getting on the radio, uh, something that I do with WTIP, there's other outreach that we do. For example, the visibility of the farmer's market program was another great way for people to see, see those signs saying, you know, we accept together we grow through WIC to be able to see things in the community like that. Um, and I think the grocery stores do a good job with visibility where they sometimes have those little WIC stickers under a certain item where somebody might say, oh, how could I, how could I get, get that um, access? Thank you. And if I may, Commissioner, I'll also add that internally within the Public Health and Human Services Department, we're often referring families to WIC, whether it be through some of our economic <coughs> assistance or health care programs. If someone is applying for health care coverage or perhaps cash assistant, cash assistance, we are referring them to, to WIC as well as those presenting on intake who are looking for nutrition or other financial supports. Um, how do you communicate with Grand Portage community with their health care, mm -hmm. with their social services? I mean, about your programming for the younger yeah. children. Mm -hmm. Uh, once a month, we have what we call the perinatal committee meeting, um, and this is the programs that I just talked about, as well as OB care, primary mm -hmm. care, preventative care from a provider standpoint. So uh, once a month, we get together with the providers offering prenatal and postpartum care at the clinic, myself, and then uh, Kristen Flett and Jen Sorensen from Grand Portage, their parent-child health nurse and, and director. Uh, and so that's a really good opportunity for us to see which, which families we're serving, where we can have give and take. And then occasionally there will be a time um, where I'll connect directly with Kristen to, to say, this person has reached out to me at Sawtooth, we're initiating services, how would you like to share this um, to be able to be that hyper-local source um, and, and to offer referrals back and forth that way. Thanks. Any other questions? <coughs> What do you see as the greatest challenge for your position in the program? Hmm. I would say that um, I, I think that the greatest challenge, of course, is to, to keep it forever new. <laughs> I think, you know, to be truly present in every moment with families um, is something that I practice and work really, really hard at. And I think it takes uh, an immense amount of focus and openness and presence um, to really understand what people are sharing, what they're withholding, what they want to work on, what they just want to say is potentially a goal. And so uh, sorting that out and really offering that unconditional positive regard and presence is a challenge and a beautiful task. Yeah, so no cookie cutter way of doing it. No, yeah, family. Mm -hmm. This is totally a joke, so please don't take offense, but it wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense, though. Everyone's different. Every family's mm -hmm. different. And yeah, yeah, you have to be able to navigate that mm -hmm. and, and meet their needs. So. Great. <coughs> any, any, any other? No. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much for having me. Look forward Thank to you. the next time, and have a great day. Yes. That moves us on down to item five, our director's report. I'll hand it over to Allison. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you again, Hannah, for being here this morning. Start as always with staff updates. A lot of activity in the hiring space in the last month. Uh, thrilled to be welcoming Lily Gruber Schultz to our team next Monday, April 22nd is her start date. 
Lily will be filling the position of adult mental health case manager that has been vacant since February of 2023. This is over a year that this position has been vacant. So I want to recognize those who have really stepped up to provide coverage for that large and complex caseload over the last year plus, including Dana Logan, who's been working in an out-of-class appointment, John Speaker, who has been providing case management support as well as supervision of that team, and Anna Ross, who recently took a position at the Sawtooth Mountain Clinic but continued to see some of her clients on that adult mental health caseload following her transition to adult service as social worker last year. Uh, Lily brings a great uh, deal of education and experience, uh, most recently with youth age 16 to 24 in a short-term intensive substance abuse treatment program in a residential setting. So really excellent experience with substance use co-occurring disorders that will serve her well working with the adult mental health population here in Cook County. Uh, also thrilled to be welcoming Leanne Avery to the team uh, in May. Uh, she's projected to start in mid-May. As you know, currently Leanne is the community center assistant up at the community center following that pathway that Isabella forged a few years ago when she made a similar jump from community center assistant to public health and human services office support and case aid. So obviously Leanne brings great experience with county systems wonderful customer service and administrative support, as well as uh, the program development that she grew over the years in support of the farmer's market and kitchen incubator program and other community center initiatives. Uh, Leanne, I also learned in her interview, has experience in WIC programming, similar to what you heard from Hannah this morning, and undergrad work in psychology. So she also brings a, a background in health and human services. Uh, Leanne, again, is projected to start mid-May, but we'll be starting some onboarding work over the next few weeks to get started on some of that uh, training. Um, we are also oh, excited. Allison, oh, uh, yeah. Commissioner Johnson had a question. Oh, sorry. I just have a question about um, that position mm -hmm. as office support case aid when we already had an office support case aid and making it two of those now instead of where it had been over in adult and I don't where wherever that case aid position I think it was the adult and home column before thank you for your question Commissioner Johnson I will uh, describe again the the switch that we are making with those support staff positions I'll draw your attention to the organizational chart page 19 in your board materials uh, so historically, we have always, or at least in recent years, had uh, three support staff positions, three case aid positions. One being that primary office support case aid position in the front window of the office. Isabella was in that previously. Leanne is moving into that position. Uh, prior to uh, Sarah Kunover's resignation late last year, we had a dedicated uh, case aid for the economic assistance team. So that position That's that you now see Rocio in on the org chart was previously under Doug Mara with the economic assistance okay. and healthcare team. Knew it got moved. And that change uh, was influenced in part due to the um, transition of MTM services to MTM services for healthcare access coordination. That was a big function of the economic assistance case aids workload was doing all of that coordination of hotels and lodging reimbursement for medical assistance enrollees. Um, as we contracted that out with the rest of the region <coughs> to this other provider, um, we saw opportunity to, to modify that position and also strengthen support of those primary clerical functions of the front office team. So presently, and these positions are now with DDA being scored right now and under review, um, but the, now we have two identical job descriptions that Rocio and Leanne will be working under that are splitting their time between agency-wide clerical and administrative customer support functions and case aid work for the economic assistance team. Is that's where we have a really high workload of scanning and data entry for all of the economic assistance and healthcare programs. Thank you for that clarification. I, I struggle with learning who's in what position and what their title is today. So, um, and what they're you. doing now. <laughs> There's a lot. That was a good question. Thank you. Yeah. 
And we still have one vacancy on the support staff team, that being the social services case aid that is, is more okay. client focused, transports, um, and data entry on behalf of the social services team. That position reports to Martina Johnson. Um, our other new hire since uh, our March meeting was approved on our consent agenda, and that's the lateral transfer of Laura Nelson from in-home support coordinator to adult services social worker. So again, backfilling that vacancy most recently created by Anna's okay. transition to the clinic. Uh, this is a, a lateral transfer. Again, they are, the positions are graded the same, but it's an opportunity for Laura to really expand her skills and scope of work, learn new systems, interact with community members in a different way as a case manager. Um, we continue to interview for that coordinated crisis response position, the developmental disabilities case manager position, and the social services case aid. We are also posting for the in-home support coordinator position vacated by Laura's transfer. Yes. One more question. Please, please. The crisis response worker, did you do interviews? Were there mm -hmm. anything you can share yet? Uh, we have had, I believe, three people now uh, interview for that position, and we're in the process of second interviews, background checks, reference okay. checks. So moving forward in meaningful ways with that position. Okay. Thank you. Hope to have hiring news to share next month. That's encouraging. Um, <coughs> other staff news, Molly and I attended an event sponsored by NACO in Yavapai County, Arizona last month, early this month. Uh, this was a peer exchange in which we learned from leaders in local law enforcement, court systems, behavioral health providers, about their uh, formation and, and work of a justice and mental health collaborative in Yavapai County, Arizona. Uh, where we were um, site, uh, situated was at uh, the newly constructed Justice Center in Prescott, Arizona, which is about two hours northeast of Phoenix. Very large county in terms of geography with <coughs> rural remote communities, not dissimilar from, from Cook County, but obviously a much larger population base. Um, Molly and I are going to be meeting in the coming weeks to put together a presentation to share with our local mental health advisory council about some of our findings, what we learned about their formation of a mobile crisis response program in a very rural remote area, some of the uh, jail diversion and reentry programs that they've partnered on and how they're really um, improving services to justice involved individuals with mental health and substance use in uh, Arizona. So more to come um, via the local mental health advisory council will also be likely sharing information with our multidisciplinary crisis response teams and other stakeholders involved locally in our coordinated crisis response pilot program. But it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. uh, NACO must have some kind of agreement with Arizona because we have another event coming up. This time, uh, Nancy Deming, our licensor and child care coordinator, was invited to speak as a part of a panel discussion at uh, a local strategies for building child care capacity event in Arizona. Again, this is NACO sponsored through that prenatal to three leaders academy that Nancy has been participating in in her role as our child care coordinator. So Nancy will have the opportunity to share about what we're doing here in Cook County to support the local child care workforce. So really grateful for Nancy's work and the recognition that she's being able to share this on a national scale. Uh, any questions on our staff updates before I move into agency reports? doesn't look like it thank you uh, the big news in our department in the last month is that we were awarded a four-year grant from the Minnesota Department of Health uh, to ramp up our work in the youth substance misuse prevention and suicide prevention arena um, as you know Andrew Orrest who's here today and Grace as well um, <coughs> has been working under that rural communities opioid response grant for the last I want to say two years um, that is also a, a time-limited grant um, and is also supporting uh, work of our partners at the Sawtooth Mountain Clinic 
Grand Portage and uh, other local and regional service providers. Uh, this grant was w written with a focus on youth prevention and engagement. One of the deliverables includes the formation of a uh, coalition, which we're already in the early stages of here with our Substance Misuse Prevention Coalition. Um, our focus under that Rural Communities Opioid Response Grant has been uh, really on harm reduction, naloxone access, making those connections across systems with law enforcement, county attorney courts, uh, primary care and other local and regional service providers. The goal of this project will really to be to build our capacity and have additional staff time to focus on youth <coughs> and the specific needs of young people in our community as it relates to substance misuse prevention. Uh, so this will uh, fund a full-time youth prevention coordinator uh, the grant is $125,000 per fiscal year over the course of four years. Uh, we met with the Minnesota Department of Health yesterday for our welcome to the, the grant meeting and to learn more about the timeline. Um, we anticipate having the contract agreement in June and we'll present it to this board. And alongside that, uh, I expect to begin posting for that position in mid-May. Um, hiring within the existing public health educator job description that we um, have and was recently reviewed. Um, any questions about the grant? Wow. Congratulations. Yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, we're really Hopefully thrilled. they'll find a house, or maybe they'll be here already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's coming, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. We'll continue to keep you informed as that moves forward, as well as our uh, local mental health advisory council. Was that, I'm sorry, was that a four year? It is a four year, year grant, yeah. so yeah. half a million That's dollars came in to Cook County to support youth engagement and prevention. Um, I guess I do have a question. Just so you're using the current public health educator um, job description it, as a base, or mm -hmm. okay, and then kind of modifying okay thank you get more specific with the targets of okay mm -hmm. the way the position descriptions were written are they're broad enough to encompass <coughs> the various grants that the educators might be working under what we're moving towards is a general job description with uh, job addendums for program mm -hmm. and grant specific work we're in the mm -hmm. process with this right now with our social work team we have a number of staff in that social worker um, job class, um, some of which have overlap and others with very unique programs mm -hmm. and populations that they're serving. Smart, thank you. Um, you may have seen uh, recent media releases and social media outreach on our various partnerships within the Rural Communities Opioid Response Program initiatives. Uh, one of those being a drug take back day coming up at the end of this month in partnership with law enforcement. Um, we have also been working to pilot a leave behind kit program, which is pretty innovative as well for our, our community to uh, ensure that first responders have uh, materials to be able to leave with homes or individuals that are interacting with emergency response so that they have those naloxone, Narcan, test strip tools um, readily available in the future. I'm sorry, Allison, I had a, a, another thought going back to the, the, the grant. Um, how restrictive is the grant as far as the duties that we can assign to that position? Um, and maybe you don't need to know exactly, but where I'm going with that is just that whole restorative justice thing. Clearly different programs, and but there's certainly a lot of overlap, um, potentially. Um, and I'm just spitballing and brainstorming if there's, if there's room or if it's gonna be fully stacked as is with, with the, the, the expected duties from the grant. Yeah, I think Grace is <coughs> able to speak to that. So the first year of the grant is really structured to be about capacity building. Grace, would you mind coming up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
Thank you. <clears throat> I kind of speak up. I don't even need to try that. <laughs> All right, is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's for the, you know. For the for the people at home, right? <laughs> so the first year of the grant is about capacity building. So there's a cohort within the Department of Health that goes through a strategic planning process together. So the first year is really about listening to both professionals serving young people. That would include, for example, the folks working in the restorative justice program and also um, young people themselves. So the idea is before any programming comes along, you really understand what is already happening so you're not uh, overlapping with existing services and you also understand what the needs and experiences of youth ages 10 to 24 are. Um, and you know, when we wrote the grant, we can we can say there are certain groups of those 10 to 24 that do that are at a higher risk of uh, suicide-related experience or substance misuse experience. So we want to make sure that we're then listening to everyone, but also ensuring that we're listening at those to those groups that are at the highest risk for for experiencing some of the outcomes that we're trying to prevent through this work. So um, that first year is really a lot about listening, learning, and building a program. And then the three years following are about implementing that program. So we will be very mindful of not overlapping with restorative justice. And really, it's a huge asset that they're here so that they can do some of that direct service work. Um, and we can then kind of refer back and forth to the different interventions that come out of this project thank you that's awesome yeah I, yeah and I, I wasn't as concerned about overlap as much as just like leveraging what we're already doing with the overlap you know so but that sounds awesome and yeah I Not think it'll be a fantastic position for someone who's really passionate about working with young people so thank you okay sorry to back backtrack there no great question and thank you grace for yeah, absolutely that. <clears throat> um, the other event that we are planning uh, alongside that drug take back day on April 27th is a warrant resolution day. This is being led again by our uh, amazing team of uh, Andrea Orist and Brenda Port uh, in coordination with the county attorney's office and 6th judicial district. Uh, so you expect to see a media release on that event uh, later this week. Again, pretty historic for Cook County to be offering a warrant release day or warrant resolution. Commissioner Johnson. Oh. Yeah. You just say that again, <laughs> what, what it is? So this is a warrant resolution day. This is an event in which people <coughs> with outstanding warrants <coughs> can uh, <coughs> present at the courthouse um, and uh, resolve that warrant. Um, primarily, these are people with mm -hmm. low-level warrants uh, they can meet with a public defender who can advise them on the status of their case. Um, and this is, uh, the goal of this is to help reduce some of the disproportionate impacts of the warrant system. Mm -hmm. like an we have a large number of those in our county? Hi. I believe Molly I did a query that. to see how many we had. Do you remember what that was? There was like 1,500. Just kidding. What? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, yeah, let me, hold on, let me. Did know about this. Remember the Maybe search term that. here. And I can tell you. Can you also see if I have one? <laughs> yeah, 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 I'll let you know. Uh, who did I send it to most recently? Huh. Uh, while Molly's looking that up, I'll also mention that Brenda, who is our um, substance use dis disorder and co-occurring disorders case manager, is uh, a point person if people are looking for more information or to coordinate transportation support to the event on the 27th. Mm -hmm. Commissioner White. Uh, I, why are there, why does people, why does people, yeah. Why would a person have a warrant? Like, this is, I only watch cop movies and I don't pay that much attention. So in real life, why would there be a, a warrant for some, that would be for their arrest, I'm assuming? Hmm. Why Attorney Hook, yeah, why please. Why doesn't the sheriff? <laughs> arrest? Yeah. Why are they out there? What's the process? So these could be for 
various reasons. Any of the warrants that we're referring to here are as a result of court action. Uh, it's not like an arrest warrant for probable cause, like the sheriff's office did an investigation and discovered there was probable cause to charge somebody and now they're going to go grab that person. <coughs> That's not this scenario. This scenario is where a case has actually been filed, a criminal complaint has been filed. <coughs> Either the person failed to show up um, at their initial appearance and um, so the court issued a bench warrant because they never f showed up. Or they showed up initially and then they quit showing up. They didn't go to their sentencing. Or they were sentenced and then they were on probation. They violated their probation and, uh, and a warrant was issued for that reason. Um, and they uh, were never located and arrested on that warrant. So these are warrants existing <coughs> where um, the person was not located and arrested. Sometimes they flee out of state. Um, sometimes law enforcement can't locate them. It's, you know, we'd have to ask the sheriff's office about how they, you know, whether they include searching for people on warrant status in their everyday patrol duties. I kind of suspect that, that they don't do that for every single one of these warrants. I have um, 18 pages of warrants here. Um, each page has two to four, let's say an average of three, so we've got uh, 18 times 30, 18 times three. 54, thank you. Yeah, not all of these are the kind of um, cases that we could resolve without arrest, um, but many of them are things for, like, here's a person who was charged in 2012 with underage consumption of alcohol. So at that time, she was under 21. Uh, now she's 12 years older than that. It's a minor offense. It's not the kind of uh, offense that we would like to transport her from, say, Wisconsin, if she was arrested in Wisconsin. The, the cost of transporting here, her here uh, would greatly outweigh any benefit. So, um, and folks, are often avoiding court or turning themselves in on their warrants because they suspect that they're going to be taken into custody and held for multiple days or until their sentence is complete. And so these cases just hang out there. They continue to be a burden on the court system, on our office to some extent, on the sheriff's office to some extent. Um, I see misdemeanor domestic assaults. I see uh, DWI, as I see, you know, check, um, checks, bad checks written, these kind of things. Um, and the idea of doing a warrant resolution is we can get them in here, we can reinstate their case, have them come back, um, set a court date, resolve their case, have them pay their fine, um, or, uh, you know, agree to probation. Um, and they can then exist in the world without the fear of being arrested at any time. They might be pulled over for speeding. Um, these warrant resolution days are regularly done, at least for the last few years in St. Louis County. It's going to be the first one for Cook County. Lake County hasn't done one before. Um, you know, sometimes folks who are here working, um, like students from other countries, get a DWI or a criminal damage to property, they leave the country, they never come back. So those are not the type of cases that we're expecting folks to turn up for, but yeah. So does your office, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. <laughs> is your office contacting these 54 cases and saying, show up and we aren't gonna arrest you? Or we don't, you don't know, if, how do they know to come in and do this? Public Defender's Office is going through the list and contacting folks. Um, and then we put, you know, something in the paper. Um, the Public Defender's Office in Duluth will also do their own kind of marketing of the event. event. Um, yeah, so that's how they know. Mr. Mike, did you have a question too? So it's sort of like a do-over. It's like, okay, come on, we're just going to kind of forget about this. Come on in, let's talk about what we can do. Yeah. And so 
I get that. Yeah. You could probably post in the bathrooms at bars. <laughs> okay, not a bad idea. <laughs> It's, um, I'm, it's not a stereotype, but you know, yeah. this is a socialization <coughs> area. That's, that's yeah. why. Yeah, it's thinking about that. And, uh, you know, somebody with an active warrant who knows they have an active warrant, there must, <laughs> they, they walk around with that cloud <sighs> over their head. They may be less likely to become a productive member of society because they're afraid to interact, you know, as, as, we, those of us who don't have active warrants, um, can do. We go to school, we, uh, you know, we get jobs, we work in government. All these things are not necessarily what somebody who feels like a criminal every day is, is going to do. So, yeah. I, I really applaud the effort. It's very pragmatic um, versus like principled, right? We're still, we're still um, following our laws but really trying to resolve. I don't know if do-over is quite the right word, but it's kind of like, hey, this is unresolved. Let's, let's finish this. Okay. You know, let's take care of this versus just letting it hang out there. So it's, it's a really, I hadn't heard of this before, and I really, I really like it, and I'm really curious how, how successful it'll be. I mean, it seems like a very difficult thing, and um, with my outstanding warrant, I don't know that I'll be coming in, but, um, but I encourage nice. others, too. Nice. There's um, no penalty. Well, no, there's no penalty for having been AWOL for all this time. Oh, that's is a that good true? question. Right, I, right. Oh, like avoiding the yeah, yeah. situation. Or how uh, there's not necessarily no penalty. Um, I mean, some of these are sex offenses, and those folks are not going to be promised they won't be arrested. Um, for a probation violation, we're going to find you in violation of probation if, you've, if you left five years ago and never completed your violation. Mm -hmm. uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but we can re, uh, we can get them back into the system to become compliant. <laughs> That's the idea. Every case is going to be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. We'll have um, Neil Patterson and Jean Munson will be present at the um, warrant resolution event and we'll have an opportunity before the event to conference and talk about what the appropriate resolutions would be for these various cases. And does this happen before our judge then? Is that who makes the final decision? Yes. Our uh, Judge Hankey is has also made himself available by Zoom to resolve cases on a Saturday. You know, the, all of these things are happening on a Saturday so that people are more likely to be here. <coughs> wow. Nice work. Mm -hmm. It was the initiative of Public Health and Human Services. I think the first email I got uh, was from Brenda at PHHS. Awesome. So they get credit. Thank you, Brenda. Oh, please, Commissioner White. How many do you anticipate this first round? Like half maybe showing up? One, one person showing up? Well, since we've never done it before, I just... Don't know. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, and if if uh, report back. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say mm -hmm. if our office is is not necessarily right, we're not the contact for the outstanding warrants, and right. so a lot of it is hanging on the public defenders and how well that yeah. outreach goes. So yeah. it's like there's a lot of. Huh. What day did you say this was? Twenty seventh. Twenty seventh. Yep. So if you guys know anyone with something hanging over their head, have them contact the public defender's office and, and talk about how this might go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Molly, for being able to address those questions. Appreciate yeah. it. <coughs> uh, briefly, <coughs> before I um, speak to the items for board action, I'll mention that another uh, initiative of our public health department over the last month has been support for planning the emergency services conference that's coming up this weekend. Uh, a few relevant <coughs> um, sessions that we're, we're providing support to and planning include suicide prevention skills training, Andrea Orist will be presenting, uh, American and Red Cross will be on site to do emergency shelter training. Uh, we have uh, Luke Campbell from the Minnesota Department of Health 
presenting on de-escalating emotionally charged situations. So some of that kind of de-escalation strategies that are valuable for first responders and just about anyone. <clears throat> we'll also have an armor radio refresher training. Uh, you can find more on the website with the full list of sessions and a registration link. That being the county website. Uh, last update since our March meeting was that we, um, on that day of our board meeting last month, March 19th, acquired the lift equipped van that will be used for our Boreal Transit Partners uh, collaboration with uh, Care Partners and the in-home support program. So we have the vehicle now in our possession. We're working on the, the policies, the procedures, the marketing, um, and anticipate having more information to share. Uh, as that program's rolled out yet this spring or early summer. Any other questions before I move on to items for board action? Nope. Okay. Uh, first up under items for board action is a request to formalize joining the National Age Friendly Community Network. Last month you heard a presentation from Care Partners um, the uh, AARP and Public Health and Human Services staff on our collaborative efforts to assess the needs of community members. Grace <coughs> has a handout to share um, that uh, provides a summary on the report that you heard last month on uh, what we learned over about six months of community engagement, surveys, listening sessions throughout Cook County uh, to better understand the experiences <coughs> of community members. Really lovely work on that handout, Julie, that looks so nice. It's fun to see the, the data as well as the, the faces of the people who are leading this work and uh, took the time to share their um, input and experiences. So, um, what we're asking for today is that the Public Health and Human Services Board approve the proclamation and letter of support for joining the National Age Friendly Communities Network. Um, I'm very happy to read the proclamation out loud if, if people want. I don't know that it's... Do you want me to? Yes. Okay. For the, I think yes. for the public. Sure. Well, for the... For the public, just know that it's in our in our packet, and and here is the audio, if um, if that's helpful. Uh, whereas the health and safety of residents of all ages are of the highest concern to the citizens of Cook County, and whereas the World Health Organization has noted that quote making cities and communities age friendly is one of the most effective policy approaches for responding to demographic aging unquote, and whereas the AARP network of age friendly communities, the network is an affiliate of the World Health Organization's Global Network of Age-Friendly Cities and Communities, an international effort launched in 2006 to help cities prepare for rapid population aging. And whereas members of the network become part of a global network of communities, they are committed to giving residents of all ages the opportunity to live rewarding, productive, and healthy lives. And whereas the network helps participating communities become great places for all ages by adopting such features as safe, walkable streets, better housing and transportation options, access to key services, and opportunities for residents to participate in community activities. And whereas the benefits of AARP network include, but are not limited to, access to key information about best practices among age-friendly communities, access to a global network of participating communities, technical expertise, financial assistance, and public recognition of Cook County for its commitment to becoming a more age-friendly community. And whereas well-designed, livable communities promote health and sustain economic growth, and they make for happier, healthier residents of all ages. And whereas, as the U.S. population ages and people stay healthy and active longer, communities must adapt. And whereas planning processes include community revitalization and economic development plans should include the needs of all people regardless of age, income, physical ability, race, gender, and other factors. And whereas the County Aging Coalition of Public Health and Human Services Advisory Council has formed with membership including residents, business and service providers, and professionals working in the age-friendly sphere, 
And whereas the Cook County finds that this resolution is in the best interest and welfare of all of its residents, now therefore be it resolved that to ensure Cook County is a well-designed, livable community that promotes a high quality of life and sustained economic growth for residents of all ages, the Cook County Public Health and Human Services Board supports the Cook County Aging Coalition and Public Health and Human Services Advisory Council and be it further resolved that the Public Health and Human Services Director shall coordinate with the Cook County Aging Coalition and Public Health and Human Services Advisory Council, including facilitating staff representation and action as its fiscal agent for funds to further age-friendly community initiatives. And be it further resolved that the Cook County, Board, Cook County Public Health and Human Services Board supports application to and requests participation as a part of the AARP network of age-friendly communities. So that's that. Could I get a? You can get email? a motion. Oh, I would okay. like I get a motion? to make a motion to approve the proclamation and the letter of support. Thank you, Commissioner Selvin. We have a motion. Is there support? Ran Ran Rana. Rana. Uh, uh, okay. All right. We do have support. support. Yes. Uh, any further discussion? I would just Commissioner Johnson. I don't know who's taking care of all this. Is it Andrea or who? Somebody. But I went on the website. I signed up for the newsletter that's offered through AARP, and there was already a little star at Grand Marais. And when you clicked on it, it said some, what's happening in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. So oh. whoever's in charge <laughs> of this of contacting AARP probably should let them know. Th that's not where Grand Rapids is. Mm -hmm. Thank you. For bringing that to our attention, <laughs> Commissioner Johnson. Is there a star in Grand Rapids, though? I actually didn't find one over in Grand Rapids. There was Brainerd. There was another place. I was going, and I finally decided, this is not how I need to be spending my time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks well, for letting so us I know. quit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if Grand you Rapids You drew the line. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, good point. Any other further discussion? Uh, hearing or seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Mash motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And that moves us down to uh, item B. And this is the um, the contract for the EDMS that we had a presentation on. But I'll hand it back over to Allison. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this, again, is a, a follow-up to last month's meeting. In March, I gave a presentation on the the need and the opportunity to invest in a new electronic document management system for economic assistance and health care programs and to join a regional effort to invest in a electronic document management system for social services as we're currently working primarily in paper files and then a wide range of electronic filing <coughs> solutions. Uh, the request before you today is to authorize me to enter into agreement with NCT Caseworks for an electronic document management system, um, as well as the two third-party vendor contracts that are associated with this request, the first being the hosting agreement with Candy Ojai County, um, as well as with Content Services Consulting, which is a third-party vendor that provides the data extraction and migration from our current uh, regional on-base uh, electronic document management system. Um, a few notes on some updated budget assumptions. Uh, what is included in the agreement you probably noticed is considerably higher than what I presented last month. That reason being what I presented included that bottom line impact to uh, the budget ongoing and to our fund balance use for the current year 2024. And that factored in the federal reimbursement that we will receive by reporting these expenses mm. to the state as a part of our quarterly reporting. So what you see reflected in the agreement is the, the full amount of the expense before we're able to bill back and get the reimbursement from the state. <coughs> Thank you for clarifying that. Absolutely. Um, I also um, increased that amount um, based on updated information from uh, content service consulting, again, who is the vendor that provides that migration and data extraction services. 
we're still meeting and developing some of those assumptions for what that expense will be based on the number of documents that we have mm -hmm. in the current system as well as some of our our unique nuances with Carleton County providing child support services and just sorting out what will be the responsibility of Cook County up front versus Carleton County up front will be reflected in our um, annual purchase of service agreement for child support services going forward. Uh, currently, we pay for one license in the child support EDMS for Cook County cases. Uh, alternatives, uh, if we are, if the board does not elect to invest in this uh, agreement in 2024, uh, alternatives would involve, it would include continuing utilizing a combination of paper and electronic file management systems for social services uh, and invest in economic assistance and healthcare EDMS only. We do not have a choice as it relates to economic assistance and healthcare programs. We cannot go back to paper files. The volume is too high, it is too complex to unwind that. Uh, a risk of delaying the investment and moving forward with social services alongside economic assistance and health care programs is that we miss out on that considerable multi-county investment and the opportunity of, of scaling this up with other counties in the region that we are very accustomed to partnering with on big initiatives like this. I'm happy to entertain any questions about the agreement. Commissioner Johnson. Um, it's not about the agreement, and I think it's a good idea. I'm glad we're working with other counties, but I'm looking through my notes here. Yesterday, there was an AMC uh, 2024 legislative update, mm -hmm. and one of the things that was discussed was the SSIS modernization. Mm -hmm. And so I was reading about that. So there, there could be funding coming for this sort of thing. And I'm wondering if there's been any talk with the other counties that we're partnering with of maybe waiting until May to know what is the actual amount and will it be reimbursable if we've already purchased or made that investment yeah. or is it just going forward? I tried to leave, read the bill language, but I'm not a lawyer and I hate that. Um, so. I'm wondering if you have any background on what you've heard about that kind of legislation. Absolutely, thank you for the question. And as I understand, the, the modernization um, efforts underway specific to the SSIS, or Social Services Information System, are to update much needed fixes within the state system for documentation, for case planning, for payment, for a number of our social services. Um, this would not, support electronic document management system. As I understand, I'm happy to clarify that. Yeah, but I, it, your question brings a very interesting and, and valid point to this, is that any funds appropriated in the legislative session are not reflected in the revenue assumptions that I presented to you last month. So it is possible that there would be additional state funds allocated to counties, I would hope, not yeah. counting on it, but, um, that there might be additional funding appropriated that could reduce the impact to our fund balance use in 2024 and ongoing. I got the impression from the discussion this is happening with all counties. They're frustrated with right. the state systems and they're going in saying, counties need help. Mm -hmm. You kind of mess things up. You need to send money back to the counties because we need to fix what you're not doing right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just was wondering, wanted to make sure we're not, you know, missing out on money because we maybe should have waited until this passes, but I don't know. I don't see a, okay. a risk in missing out on state funds by delaying this agreement. I think moving forward now, committing to the region, to the vendor that we're a part of this multi-county project is in the best interest of the county and the department. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good to be strategic. Thank you for mm -hmm. bringing that up. Uh, any other questions? Mr. Chair, I'd like to move that we authorize Director McIntyre to enter into a contract with CaseWorks and with Candy Ohio County for coasting, hosting and current services consulting for the data mi migration. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. We have a motion. Is there support? 
I'll support. Thank you, Commissioner White. We have a motion and support. Further discussion? It's going to be a big deal. Thank you for, for your efforts there, and it's very important. There's, yeah. I, much like Commissioner Johnson was, was saying, I also hear a lot about the frustrations, um, particularly with um, um, the, state, the state system and, and public health and human services. So um, hopefully this will help alleviate some of that, even though it's a different, right? It's not the state system itself, so, but I'm hopeful. Step by step. We do. Okay. I was just giving further discussion, All but right. yeah. I tend to go on and on. So, <laughs> uh, any other discussion? Hearing or seeing none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to our committee reports. We flew through them last time, and we do have a little bit of time here, so. We can uh, embellish a little bit more. Active Living Steering Committee, Commissioner White. Anything to embellish? Nothing to embellish. Okay. <laughs> AEOA, Arrowhead Economic Opportunity Agency, Commissioner White. No. And Arrowhead Health Alliance, uh, Commissioner White. Oh, you met with Rick. Yes. That's an, that's an update there. Any, anything further? No. Oh, meeting was good. Very good. Um, Arrowhead Regional Corrections, Commissioner Johnson. Our next meeting is this Friday, um, and Commissioner Gudermont is the chair again for oh. another year. Okay. Um, Child Care Solutions Subcommittee, Commissioner Storley. Thank you. I'll start the embellishment. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we did talk about, you know, where we've been for the last two years, and and um, you know with health assessments survey needs and supports of like the birch grove saplings and um, after school programs increase of wages of health care workers um, slots for the children and and uh, of course always applying for grants so that's where we've basically been now where do we need to work on and that would be a need for more infant care and we are working on that at birch grove with a, a room set aside for that. Um, and cost to parents. You know, I understand there's going to be some grants that Minnesota people can apply for. We just haven't heard that that's passed yet, but hopefully that will before the end of the session. Um, and driving to care. You know, folks who live out in the woods needing child care and having to drive a distance um, for that. And then something I never really thought of, and none of us really did, and that's the crisis drop-off. A family has an emergency, and the children need to be taken care of for an hour, two hours, or whatever. Um, I think at one time there was a drop-off at the Y. Um, I don't believe that's continuing now. So um, that's a big need. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. kind of where we're looking at for... Um, Child care solutions, and I'm really glad that Nancy's going to go to the uh, to the workshop, um, and glad that she's been called to do that. Um, there is um, a website called Legislative Child Care Where Aware, and that is just for us to kind of keep track what's going on with the legislative uh, sessions with child care, and um, so you know, there's all these little things that come along that um, we meet every other month. So it's kind of like a good, a good way to at least keep up with what the legislative actions are. Child's, legislative child wear care. Okay, so that is my report for child care. Excellent embellishment, that was a lot. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, I heard on the radio yesterday that um, the child care assistance might be less than they're originally aiming for, which Mm -hmm. It's too bad, but I'm still so happy that they're making efforts in that direction because it's mm -hmm. yeah, it's just not yeah. affordable um, for families. Okay, um, community health board. Um, um, we had a meeting, and um, I think I reported I'm I'm no longer chair. We have Commissioner Harla from St. Louis County who is now chair, and um, and she's changing the the format up a little bit. And so, um, whereas we used to get um, 
reports from all the different um, employees of the Community Health Board about what they've been working on and oftentimes how it affects our, our particular counties. Um, we're going to be focusing more on the foundations of public health and and how the different counties <coughs> are, are focusing or implementing those different foundations. And so um, threw me for a little bit of a loop just trying to readjust what what I'm trying to take in and what to, to communicate. Um, and uh, I expressed as much. Uh, and um, and one of the suggestions was like, well, just have staff report. And I was like, oh, okay. But that's something that I felt like I should be doing in, in that connection. So I'll still still do my darndest to, to, to give my, my take on that. Um, there also wasn't going to be as much emphasis on the, um, the doctor's report there. And that was one of my favorite parts of those meetings, is just learning some of those um, topics that, that, that he's seeing um, in, the, in the, whether the news or the community or in his office. And um, uh, he still gave his report and, um, which, oh, what was this one on? Oh, I can't even remember now. Uh, well, sorry about that. Um, it was it was abbreviated and not not as much emphasis, but I'm happy to to still learn things there on, on that front. So, well, let's see. Um, Cook County Local Advisory Council for Children's and Mental Health, uh, Rana. Yes. Well, you have the year-end report that was in the packet, which I think is I think it's been a very good year for our group. One of our goals has been to get more people on the committee and more diversity and we have a few people I think are going to join soon and um, that's helpful and we had we always have people presenting on other things that have been going on like this the student survey and we had a wonderful presentation by um, St. Louis County's Mental Health Advisory Council um, chair I think and talked about what they're doing and we can learn a lot you know, helping, you know, finding out what other people are doing so we don't have to just reinvent the wheel ourselves all mm -hmm. the time. <coughs> and I was especially impressed by the recent report by Andrea Orst on the uh, harm reduction and all of those things going on. It's people are really accomplishing things and I think meeting goals that we've set. And I think this county as a whole really helps people live good lives here, living here. So it's good. Anything else? <laughs> I think so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to all the members and guests of our advisory council over the last year. <clears throat> it's impressive to see all that staff. I didn't staff say new, new staff, too. Individuals yeah, who participated. That's really great. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Cook County Restorative Justice, uh, Commissioner Johnson. Um, well, that group is meeting tomorrow. They are looking for um, more members, more involvement of actually current members. You know, it's been kind of Volunteers sparse um, as far as getting people together to really be helpful on advising and going forward. And I would think I wrote down here about our warrant resolution day and. Mm -hmm. So if you have the opportunity tomorrow to come attend that meeting, that would be a good mm -hmm. place to make sure that restorative justice gets involved, you know, in what we're already doing mm -hmm. and make sure. There was a big training this last weekend. I'm not part of, I'm not that kind of person, but I know, hope they had a good turnout. Did you, were you able to? I attend? was not able to okay. go. No. You were there. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Good. Do you want me to? Yeah, I think you should. Sure. Um, so it was not this past weekend, but the, the weekend, weekend before. So I went from Arizona to Duluth for treatment court training and then three days of restorative justice training. The training was on sentencing circles. So um, the idea being that restorative justice would be an option for the, um, the court to sentence directly into mm -hmm. a sentencing circle. Um, it's a it's a pra it's a restorative justice practice um, that is different than what restorative Cook County restorative justice has been doing for the last few years. What our volunteers are trained in currently is victim offender conferencing, which is um, imagine a, a table and you got the 
victim on one side and the offender on the other side and we're and uh, volunteers for both of them and trying to come to an agreement um, what a sentencing circle is is more community members in a circle with a very specific process uh, meant so, so that everybody in that circle is um, safe to discuss give input um, one of the central um, requirements of a sentencing circle is a talking piece um, so that only one person is talking at, a, at once um, the facilitator so this would be the volunteer from Cook County restorative justice um, helps the group to set the rules but does not <coughs> make the rules for the group so um, like an example of, of a rule would be that um, we only speak as to our own our own experience. Um, uh, we do not um, provide advice unless advice is asked. And the so the community through the circle, you might have the offender there with a support person. Uh, you might have the victim there with a support person. But then you might have just general volunteers from restorative justice, community members pulled in, the prosecutor could be the, there, the defense attorney could be there. The circle comes up with the resolution for the case, and everybody must agree to that resolution. It's just a really powerful um, kind of a structure, and it's based in, you know, things our ancestors around the world have been doing for generations um, and so we had the um, we had Kay Pranis um, here for the training she did it for free um, even though she's a nationally renowned expert on um, on healing circles she's published a few books um, she has a place in Cook County and she sees this community in part as her own community and saw this as a service to her, her community um, yeah it was excellent I was there um, to learn more about sentencing circles and how you know what types of cases our office might refer to sentencing circles and how they might work and how to make sure that we can describe to the involved parties what what it's going to look like um, although it wouldn't be appropriate for the prosecutor in a case to also be the facilitator um, that would you know, one of the central tenets is also that there everybody's power is equal in that circle nobody has authority over anyone else so yeah it was it was really great it was well attended by more than 20 people um, it wasn't just people from Cook County. We also had people from Lake County, from the Finland Community Center, because Lake County is trying to start their own restorative justice program, um, and they're using us as a resource, which I think is a compliment to how we've been doing things here. So I will be at that meeting tomorrow, and um, that's an excellent idea I hadn't thought of, is to have restorative justice folks there at the warrant resolution. <coughs> Thanks for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. um, so, could, so there's a, you might approach things differently with different cases, whether it is a circle or not. Is that kind of what you're, okay. Some are better suited for the circle versus others. Is that, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, you want, everybody needs to agree to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's possible in every case. Sure. Yeah. Um, and and victims, another central tenet of restorative justice in in general, is that no victim of crime should be forced to be part of that mm -hmm. circle. So um, you can have uh, a surrogate there, maybe somebody in the community who has experienced a similar type of crime and is able to describe the type of harm caused by that crime. Um, but uh, but the defendant definitely needs to agree to be there mm -hmm. and it might not be one circle in one day It might be a six-week process with a circle held weekly mm -hmm. until the group comes to some resolution mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you <coughs> uh, Council on aging commissioner white 
They are seeking another board position, another person. That would be right. They have one person who is residing. Okay. Is there a geographic area that that person she should is, represent? I don't believe so. She's from the Hovland area. Okay. I don't believe so. Um, emergency Preparedness Committee, Commissioner Sullivan. Well, I know Allison has already shared um, quite a bit of information about the conference that will be this Friday and Saturday. It starts Friday at noon and ends Saturday a little after 5. Um, just to, um, I guess, add to some of the choices that um, this year's conference has to offer, North Memorial has an air helicopter. Um, air care will be um, provided and they'll be conducting safe landing training both um, classroom and hands-on. Last year we had the helicopter there because of rain and sleet. Um, it was not able to come. <laughs> so um, anyway, we'll pick up where we left off last year. We are going to have a session dedicated to weather radar gaps and they'll be training from the National Weather Service. Um, state perspective updates from Kevin Reed, who's the Deputy Director of Minnesota Homeland <coughs> Security and <coughs> Emergency Management. He's going to provide updates on disasters, uh, wildfires, other kind of pertinent statewide news. There'll be medical equipment training and also firefighting and EMS training available at the conference. So it's um, just going to be a wonderful opportunity for the people of Cook County, um, first responders, as well as citizens um, to participate. So I hope we'll see everyone there. Thank you. <coughs> um, Health Care Planning Committee, Commissioner Storley. Thank you. Well, I wasn't able to attend, but I have some highlights. But since Julie is here, I'll bypass that <laughs> and go on to um, Violence <coughs> Prevention Center. Um, <clears throat> the um, Kathy Ann's um, attorney's office is uh, promoting awareness <clears throat> during um, sexual violence uh, awareness month which is um, for April and um, the Sawtooth Clinic is um, continuing to expand their services for dental care now for um, ch young children as whenever they get their teeth it says zero but they don't have teeth yet <laughs> but whenever they have their teeth <laughs> up to age 26 so that's a good expansion. And for adults over 65. <clears throat> and <clears throat> there was a notification about another booster for COVID for folks that are 65 and over. So they have um, so far at, uh, at our meeting, which was the first Friday of the month, um, at that time they had over 50 people vaccinated. Probably by now they've had more. <clears throat> and that would be about it for the Health Planning Committee. <clears throat> Um, NACO, anything there? Going on to NACO. Well, our April meeting, and you have to realize that NACO works with um, <clears throat> the Senate and legislative people in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. A couple of areas that they're now focusing on is um, planning grants for correctional facilities and modernizing data systems, mm -hmm. which is huge, of course, but they're working on that. And they have different... Um, <clears throat> different areas of the status. So if it's open, that means that they're still working on it. If it's focused or forecasted, pretty much means that um, it's going to be a done deal. <laughs> For example, uh, drug-free communities. Right now they're looking at 65500000 to go toward that, but right now it's still just open for discussion. Um, <clears throat> healthcare Workforce Innovation Program is 27 million over 500,000. That's forecasted to be something that will be passed. So I could go on and on, but those are the two <laughs> things that I picked. Right now for April, there'll probably be more coming in the future months. Thank you. And both those topics are, uh, yeah. are the, the funding for mm -hmm. correctional Correct. facilities yeah. as well as modernizing the data systems are both things that we are <coughs> currently uh, we are. Yeah, mm -hmm. on our very radar, so that's very, very relevant. Thank you. Uh, Northeast Minnesota Office of Job Training, Commissioner Johnson. Um, actually, that <laughs> next regular meeting is tomorrow, or is next week. Tomorrow, there's a special meeting to deal with some personnel issues. I don't have anything else to report. Thank you. Uh, 
North Shore Collaborative. I think I shared with the group the um, um, strategic planning strategic planning process um, that we we went through. I don't I don't know if I described the the format of that, and I thought it was extremely uh, practical. It was virtual, so you know maybe not ideal, but there was a kind of a survey questionnaire sent out ahead of time, and so people could think about the questions and give responses, and then it was collected and processed by the facilitator, um, Barb Kasky, and then. Um, who is unfortunately leaving the AHA. I don't know if I shared that, but um, but anyways, I thought it was very great because oftentimes in strategic planning processes, you can be trapped somewhere for however long, kind of wordsmithing or hashing over things or, you know, and there was still some of that, but I just thought we got so much done both ahead of time and then just, I don't know, it just helped keep the, the, the process pretty smooth. So, so that was great. Um, Public Health and Human Services Advisory Council. Um, and Frank is, is not here, but Julie is here. I am here. It's good to be here. Um, so we did not meet at all since your last meeting. Uh, the next one is May 7th. Um, but the uh, advisory board, the, the working committee on the grant process has been working on um, listening to grant reports from grant people that received grants last year. Um, but the next meeting will be May 7th. Thank you. Um, anything for the good of the order? Mr. Johnson. I do. Something else to report from the AMC update yesterday was about the cannabis committee. And I'm wondering if your committee has been meeting because nope. I'd say hurry up. <laughs> According to what's happening at the state level. Oh, um, you mean the local committee? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. The the legislation, House File 3769, they um, expect that social equity applicants get a jump start on the applications and local units of government need to make sure their zoning requirements are in place because <coughs> pre-approval licenses could be coming this fall to counties, this fall. So that doesn't leave us a whole lot of time. And I wrote down here, um, AMC has model policies that they are sharing with counties. And counties will have 60 to 90 days to respond to requests or January 1st, 2025, that we, these requests will be coming to us and we have to be prepared to. Address them. Yes. So just heads up. Um, that's kind of a big thing that mm -hmm. we need to make sure is on our agendas and we're talking about how we are going to address this issue and it's I hope public health is also involved in those discussions because it it's going to impact a lot of different areas of our community mm -hmm. so, um, I think that's I have a page full of notes but those are the major ones I think need to be addressed you know Mm -hmm. Front of mind, now. yeah. Yeah, just to clarify, the um, kind of that municipal dispensary idea w won't be addressing ordinances at all. That's mm -hmm. more uh, the ordinance discussion. I think is is going to be well. Clearly, we we have a big say in that. And what we've discussed about before is like, hey, the state has um, these restrictions, and we, as a county, do not uh, restrict alcohol differently, um, or we don't have alcohol ordinances per se. And so what? more do we need to do on the county level and i think my, my memory is that we want to ensure that there is no use on county or in county facilities um and then i think we kind of went into like what does that mean exactly on the property is there a county park or a trail and the road and all that kind of stuff so um but beyond that i don't think molly have you had a attorney hicken have you had a chance uh, is there anything scheduled yet do we have I know it's a, scheduled, yeah. but our plan is to meet in May. Okay. So I collected all the availability for the parties, and now we have to mesh it up and pick the best date. The the ordinance in my in my mind, the ordinance is probably going to be most relevant for the city. Yeah. Um, I think the county could. It's important that we still look at ordinances and, and zoning, and there's all different types of businesses as well, right? Dispensary mm -hmm. is just <coughs> one type of business. There's also Right. There's a whole list of them, but you know, manufacturing or processing or growing or 
I think there's also like a, a micro business where they do everything, um, but on a really small scale. And I'm not as familiar with all the differences, but but yeah, it's impending. And yeah, when we were at the AMC research or um, the legislative session, the research committee met, and yeah, the the July deadline. It was just like, what are they doing? The counties and and so at that time there weren't any templates that they're sharing. So I'd like to get. I don't know if yeah. And I think it's important as far as zoning and where are we, where do we and as a county sit? We have to allow it. This we can't deny things currently. Um, but do we want it across from the school? Do we want the up uh, well, uh, growing? Well, that's a but city. we have other another school in the mm -hmm. West End. I mean, are there appropriate mm -hmm. is that zoning? Zoning though, or is that I don't know. It's yeah, well, it zoning. falls under. The county zoning so mm. I'm just saying I think we need to have a discussion are there appropriate areas right. and inappropriate areas I don't sure. I'm not <clears throat> making judgment on yep. that but I would like to make sure that people are discussing that right. yep. and we're considering what our alternatives might be so mm -hmm. I encourage you guys to meet and have yep. those discussions yep. sounds like maybe we will be but yeah I've, I've kind of been wrestling with that too just once I learned that there could be some zoning issues coming forward. I was like, now how does that impact Cook County and what, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to talk more about that and see what the group um, is thinking. Commissioner Strzok. Yes, and um, there is a big push for growers to get their permits pretty soon. Now, I don't know, we're not gonna probably have a 50,000 square foot growing situation going on, but there could be smaller ones mm -hmm. in Cook County and they're really pushing to be permitted first. Mm -hmm. So that's why we need to, discuss a lot of things mm -hmm. yeah. yeah part one of the things in that <coughs> amc uh, research committee discussion that also caught my eye was the licensing uh fee that's like mm -hmm. 20 grand mm -hmm. <laughs> so who's gonna pay that uh and uh i feel like that restricts who but that's for yeah. uh, there's different operation sizes or whatever so again i'm not as familiar with all the different costs for all the different ins and outs and so I wonder like what that small yeah we're not gonna have a big no. or probably not gonna have a big whatever size um, but yeah lots lots to be discussed there thank you for bringing that up um, uh, anything else for the good of the order a couple things actually I neglected to mention in my <clears throat> report I want to draw your attention to the handout that was included in the meeting materials the community health assessment two-page document I want to thank the public health staff and, uh, who helped put that together as well as the support of Stephanie Medina who is our regional public health planner through the Community Health Board. That's a really valuable tool to talk about the health assessment, how we're prioritizing resources and efforts as a department and um, you know, being strategic with our, our funding of nonprofits locally. Uh, next month, I want to give a heads up of what will be coming in May. You'll hear a year-end financial report from Plamen on 2023. Um, and I'm also planning to prepare a nearing the end of session summary with more information on, on what's happened in the legislature, what's still in progress as we uh, reach the end of session, and how that relates to some of our local health priorities and efforts as a department. I uh, also want to draw your attention to the attachment that I included under P for the good of the order. That's a flyer from Northspan, who is a regional uh, nonprofit <coughs> um, who is leading this effort locally um, throughout Cook County and uh, in a parallel process that's just a few months ahead of us in Cloquet and Fond du Lac. Uh, Northspan, uh, you may have heard of through their work. Uh, that began back in 2021 through the Welcoming Communities Initiative. Cook County Higher Ed was the local host of this uh, with a focus on social connection, re relationship building. Uh, we had a couple of staff from the department go through that cohort. Uh, they are contracting with an organization, Nonviolent Peace Force, which is an international organization uh, who has done some work in the state of Minnesota in Region 5 in the Brainerd area. Uh, we are, are helping to promote and support this event and also looking forward to hearing the findings that come out of it. Um, I had a chance to meet with Amber Lewis, who is the, the manager of the program, to, to learn more. 
Uh, she said that they've targeted May 8th as a day of story circles. Again, Cook County Higher Education will be the host of this event. The survey is live, um, so uh, within the flyer there's a link. We'll be promoting this on social media as well, cross-promoting. Uh, Amber said that they're, they're really looking for uh, information from people who are already engaged in this work to learn what's happening, where are the gaps, and that the, the outcome will be a report on their findings as well as a series of trainings that are aligned with the priorities and findings that came out of our local uh, surveys and listening sessions. Most excellent. Yeah. Very systematic and thorough and thoughtful and wow. And Amber will also be joining our May Local Mental Health Advisory Council to be able to provide more information and address questions from community members. Thank you. <coughs> Any other items for the good of the order? And now we're at the end of our agenda and we are adjourned. Thank you. Nice one. Especially the West Enders. How about those West Enders? <laughs>